Okay, so far we've seen how Gaussian processes work. Now let's see how you can implement them in practice. There's different libraries you can use for that. One of the most popular one is called GPI. And you can call you can use GPI regression to build Gaussian processes. You do have to select a kernel first. Uh, you can choose from a number of implemented functions, in this case, uh, in, in, implemented kernels. So in this case, I use I choose the RBF kernel. Uh, I, I have to choose input dimension, like the number of variables um, I'm going to fit. Um, so here it was like one dimensional, right? So I choose one here. Uh, and I choose a variance and the line scale. Um, this is optional. Uh, default is one, and the the GP is going to learn this anyway. Remember, we are going to add this to our covariance matrix, and we're going to learn this. So we give it an initial value, but after training, it this will be this will be different. We can ask the model what the final variance and line scale was. It learns these things. Um, so there's a whole library of, of, of kernels you can choose from, um, and there's also this. Um, um, abstract class, uh, so you can also define your own kernels. To build a model, uh, we just create the Gaussian process regression model. We give it x, y, and a choice of kernel, and that's it. Now we have a train model. Okay, and now we can call predict to make predictions. Uh, this is a choice of different kernels. Um, let's discuss them briefly. So RBF is generally useful. It's the, the Gaussian kernel. Uh, it's very flexible and it, it corresponds well to real data. So it's definitely something to try. If you have a good reason to think that your data is exponential, you can use exponential matrix, which looks like this. And if you're not sure, you can use the matern kernel. So the matern is, has this variable, like it's 32 here or 55 here which allows us to vary between an RBF and exponential. Um, if this value is smaller, it will be more like an exponential. If it's larger, it will behave more like an RBF. Uh, Brownian for very random data. Um, bias just adds a bias to it. Linear is linear. Um, so as x goes up, y goes up. If you, assume, if you assume there's some uh, periodic effects, like the sine wave, you can use the periodic exponential. White is white noise. And you have the polynomial kernel and the MLP kernel. And you can add these up. For instance, if your data looks like this, then you could create a kernel which is basically linear to learn this plus periodic to learn the periods plus maybe some polynomial because you it gets smaller at the end plus maybe some noise yeah. typically adding white noise helps as well okay so you could you could Construct your own kernels based on the existing ones, and then fit the data. This defines the the, the prior uh, over your data. Okay. Um, this is the untrained GP. Uh, so I've chosen um, some kernels. Uh, this is my data and the mean confidence. So I haven't looked at the data yet. After I look at the data. Uh, I can now see if, as exactly what I was doing before. So I have lower certainty around data points, a bit higher between them, uh, and very large when there's no data nearby. Right. And you can also plot the density, which is a different kind of plotting. Sometimes it's nicer to look at this. In 2D, it looks like this. right? So it's very high here, very low there vice versa. And so if you can't really show uncertainty in a map like this. What you can do is you can make a cut, like here or here, and then look at the, uh, the uncertainty. 
Yeah. <laughs> this sort of like joint. This is the insert T in the program tab. Okay, what does it actually look like? Um, like this. So we can see this uncertainty here. It's pretty uh, low uncertainty there. And again, more at the end. And this is for different cuts. This is for, I think, this one, this one, and this one. And then we get uh, these three plots. We can also do it in the other direction, like we can uh, cut here. Um, we can cut here, here, and here. And then we get these uh, cuts. Okay, uh, you can also use uh, scikit-learn to build Gaussian processes. For that, you can use the Gaussian process regressor. Again, you have to choose a kernel, and you can again choose from a range of different ones. You have to choose your alpha. That's your regularization parameter. Um, so what this does, it adds a small value to the diagonal of the kernel matrix during fitting, and this has a regularization effect. It's also called thickening of regularization. It, it, it makes the function a bit more smooth. If you make it large, this corresponds to large noise levels. Um, so it, yeah, it's a bit like this sigma thing where you, um, if you look at the covariance matrix, it has a small decrease and then problem with it as well. It does something like that. Um, and it also helps with some numerical uh, issues. It's simply very small. And then you have restarts because the optimizer tends to um, get stuck sometimes. So we typically always restart it between five and 10 times. The default is not to do restarts, but doing a few restarts makes your model much more uh, robust. Okay. Uh, after it's trained, you can do predictions, given x. And this returns the standard deviation as well. And if you then plot that, it looks like this. So again, we have nicely uh, low uncertainty at the points and more uncertainty if the points are far away. Okay. And if the data is noisy, it looks a bit like this. So if the data is noisy, so a sigma uh, is larger, then you can see this, there's still some uncertainty left, even for the points that you have seen. Okay, to conclude, um, so Gaussian processes are very, very useful. Um, you assume that the, the model is Gaussian distributed, and which means that the predictions are also probabilistic. And so you can actually compute uh, trustworthy empirical confidence intervals. It also nicely interpolates all the observations, at least for regular kernels, and it's a very versatile thing, right? So other models tend to run out of depth at some point. Uh, Gaussians can be very complex. You just, you just add kernels together to learn very complex functions, and it, it, it will still learn them, right? Problems is that, well, they're not sparse, typically, so they use the entire information you have. You build this huge kernel matrix, which is n by n, uh, which is going to be expensive. Um, there is something like sparse GPs. So what that does basically is, is it's not going to remember all the points. It's going to remember the most important points and, and forget about the rest. Uh, but still, because it's cubic, it scales cubically, they sort of lose efficiency in high dimensional spaces. Like a few dozen, maybe a hundred, and yeah, it's it's gonna be too slow to train it. And well, just in case you're wondering, yes, you can do deep GPs as well. And um, so <laughs> that basically is like a neural network. Uh, in which all the nodes are GPs. So you have some inputs, you learn GP over that, this GP makes predictions, and these are the inputs for another GP. And yeah, you, you, can, you can stack them together. 
There's also a very nice equivalence proof that a Gaussian process is equivalent to a neural network with one layer and an infinite number of nodes. This may not be, well, I think it's not so intuitive. Um, so you have your input data x. And so you're going to consider an infinite space of possible functions. So this is infinite. Right. And you're just going to learn basically how likely each of these guys is. 